In our last video, we left off on 10th Street, uh, one block north of Griswold, and we looked at Schwem's rubber stamp store, and of course, from our last video, we certainly know that it was also a candy store and a place you had lunch. Now, let's go to the other side of the street, uh, the west side, and we see the Trinity Lutheran Church. This photo gives you a much better look at it. And as you can see from this next photograph, the front doors are quite impressive. This is another uh, very old Port Huron church and has a very rich history. You can see part of this history as you walk by the church. In 1996, during their 125th anniversary year, they applied for and received recognition by the state of Michigan as a state historical site. And in this photograph, you can see uh, them putting the marker together and putting it up. Today, that corner is just a rectangle of grass. And if we zoom out a bit here, you can see that complete corner. I showed you these photographs so I can set up this next photograph that you see what the corner looks like in 1879. You can see the first church in the background there, and that home to the right is a parsonage. And that corner still looks like it has a rectangle of grass. Perhaps not quite as nice as the grass is today. The church was built in 1874, just five years before this photograph was taken. Like so many early Port Huron churches, this was a German church. It was originally known as the German Evangelical Lutheran Society at Port Huron, Michigan. Previous to this, in 1871, a small group of German settlers began gathering in a rented building near Broad Street in Erie, or now McMorrin in Erie, and they used this building for worship and fellowship. That is where the church began. I wonder in this photo if that isn't the pastor and possibly his wife that's standing in the doorway. If it is, it would be this pastor here, and Reverend J.R. Loritzen. He was their first full-time pastor. Almost immediately, they started a Lutheran school. And in this photo, taken in 1898, it shows a confirmation class. Looking down from the satellite view, uh, inside that yellow rectangle, it shows where the first church was built. At the front of the church actually faced Griswold Street. The second church was built in 1899, and that's represented by the red rectangle, and it faced 10th Street. They worshipped in the first church while the second church was being built. And in this photograph here, you can see both churches. And then the house or the parsonage over to the right, that's where the current church was built. After the first church was built, the old church became a uh, Lutheran school, uh, here you can see a picture and it designates it as a, a one-room school. Uh, and of course, there's steeples missing off of this building now. As the years went by and the church expanded, once again, Trinity Lutheran Church would rebuild into a brand new building, a brick building. And here's the write-up that was in the Times Herald. In this photograph, you're looking south down 10th Street at the new church and the, the parsonage. In 1941, the current church was built. And once again, they continued worshiping in the old church until the new church was built. And here you can see the two churches sitting side by side. This photograph here is taken from a little different angle, but you can see the new church uh, protruding over the roof line of the old church. The Lutheran School had been in continuous operation since the church's inception until it closed in June of 2017. All right, before we leave the Trinity Lutheran Church, I have two more photographs I want to show you of the interior of the church. One uh, a much earlier picture and one a more recent picture. As we continue down 10th Street, uh, we come to the southwest corner of 10th and Griswold. And here you can see that there's a Walgreens drugstore on the corner. There's been a drugstore in this corner for decades of one sort or another. 
The last drugstore in this corner is set right on the very corner, I mean right about where the sidewalks are. And here's a photograph of that drugstore. It's a shame that we have to see an accident in order to get a picture of the drugstore, but like so many photographs, the history's in the background. And this gives us a, a good idea what that drugstore looked like. This was the Benedict Kerr uh, Company. And uh, later on, about the 60s, it became just the Kerr Drugstore. Years before this, all, all the way back into the early 1900s, it was still a drugstore. And uh, we don't have a photograph of that, but we have one of the medicines bottles uh, that was provided by this drugstore and contributed by Fred Feldhaus. And here it is. The name of the drugstore was the Grizzle Street Pharmacy. And on this bottle, you can see, of course, the name, but then you can also see the location because uh, on the bottom there, it says the corner of 10th and Griswold. All right, before we go any further down Griswold Street, I want to look at one more thing on 10th Street. And this would be in the 2300 block near the tracks. Uh, right here, we have a building that today uh, looks like this. But at one time, this was the Tunnel Lumber Company. I remember as a boy going to the Tunnel Lumber Company to, to get lumber there with my dad. They had lumber inside the building, but the main lumber yard was in the rear. And this driveway that you see going along the side of the present building, this used to be the entrance to the actual lumber yard. And it used to be a gate that went across. And here we see a photograph of that lumber company with the gate. This photograph was taken much earlier, before it was Tunnel Lumber Company. Before it was Tunnel Lumber Company, it was the Wilcox Lumber Company, and before that it was the Wilcox Welch Lumber Company, and that's probably what it was when uh, this photograph was taken, because you can see that 10th Street is a dirt road. After the train tunnel was built under the St. Clair River, many businesses put the word tunnel in front of their name. Tunnel Lumber Company, though, had a legitimate reason for being called Tunnel Lumber Company because of the proximity it was to the tunnel. As you can see in this satellite photo, it was right next to the tunnel. All right, let's get back to Griswold Street as we uh, go west uh, down Griswold. Just before we get to the 11th Street, actually the southeast corner of 11th and Griswold, we come to this building here. But years ago, it was a supermarket. At this corner was where Fred Stanley's uh, market was uh, a long time ago. And uh, you can see a picture of it here in this advertisement. I get a big kick out of this ad because this is what's at the top of the ad. You're too nice a girl to be running around with every supermarket in town. This ad certainly captures your attention. Later on, the business would change hands and this would become Smith's Grocery Store. Right across the street from where the supermarket used to be, uh, on the northeast corner of 11th and Griswold Street, uh, you have these buildings here. But my generation remembers when this building housed French's Bakery. This was a very popular uh, bakery because of the location. Uh, it was very similar to uh, Schwems, in that it attracted the same students from the different schools in the area. Washington School was very close, Trinity School was very close, and Woodrow Wilson wasn't that far if you had a sweet tooth for a sweet pastry. Here's a couple more photographs that gives you a little idea what the neighborhood around French's looked like. And in this photograph here, you can see it extends a little further down Griswold. Uh, you're kind of looking uh, at the northwest. And in this photograph, you're looking in just the opposite direction. Robert French, who started the bakery back in 1908, also built the building. Mr. French originally started the bakery in his home by making bread and delivering the loaves by horse-drawn wagon. During my generation, uh, French's was actually a third generation bakery and was being run by Robert French's grandson, David Carroll. Thanks again to Mark Rummel for these photographs that you're looking at now. Dave says as a young boy, he used to stand on a wooden box and scrape the cookie sheets for his dad. 
We worked around the clock here, he said. Our bread and baked goods are fresh daily. When most people are sleeping or enjoying a late evening television program, we are baking. He also says we use a little bit more ingredients than a housewife does in her baking. Some 700 pounds of shortening are used every week at French's. About 3,000 pounds of flour and 1,500 pounds of sugar, four different kinds, also are used in a week. 100 pounds of fresh nut meats, 200 pounds of jam and jellies, again weekly, are used to complement the baked goods. More than 150 dozen donuts are baked every day at French's. The baker's life is not an easy one. Oh, but it's a sweet one. Dave was a pretty good businessman, too. For their 50th anniversary, they opened up a downtown branch in Diana's, high-class baked goods for a high-class restaurant. Here you see a photograph showing uh, Dave Carroll along with one of the co-owners of Diana's. Diana's wasn't the only location they expanded to. You can see a couple other locations right here. You see the 10th and Manville location, Jack Smith, and also Robert Hall Village. And who wouldn't love these pumpkin pies, $1.95. Chocolate eclairs, only 45 cents each. Cream puffs, one of my favorites, 45 cents. Build Long John's, apple Danish coffee cakes, cookies, three dozen for a dollar. Open seven days a week. This is, looks like it's from 1926. French's also gave us a wonderful recipe for a pie the all-American pie. Not something that you would cook in your kitchen, but uh, you can look this over at your leisure and you can see that it was for our 200th anniversary. Happy birthday, America. French's bakers have helped you celebrate birthdays since 1908 and we want to help you celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, and parties for the next 100 years. Well, unfortunately, they didn't make it business that was started in 1908 lasted until 1981 when it was closed. And you can look at this article here at your leisure. On a side note, if you look at the building to the right, uh, you can see that it says uh, French's Candy Shop. So at one time they carried candy as well, although I don't remember that. I don't know how long it was in business at that location, but uh, uh, proof is in the pudding here. First, I thought it was Fannie Mae or Fannie Farmer's candy, but if you look closely, it isn't. Thanks to this photograph from David Shannon Boyd, uh, it gives you a chance to see what it looks like uh, today, because uh, that's not what the Google picture looked like earlier in this video. It's been recently remodeled and uh, awaiting uh, new ownership. I'm not sure what's going to go in there, but but it might once again be a vibrant business like French's was. But one thing for certain, it won't have that sweet aroma that permeated the block all around French's Bakery. All right, let's leave French's and elevate ourselves a little bit. Looking down, you can see where the yellow star is. That was where French's is. And you go up just the block uh, to the north on the corner of uh, 11th and White, you see Big Earl's. Uh, restaurant and lounge. Today that corner looks like this, but in the early 1900s the corner looked like this. Most people call this building the German Gardens, but uh, the Germans called it Arbeiter Hall. And as you zoom in here you can see uh, the signage that has uh, Arbeiter Hall on it. Hall of course is spelled uh, in the German version with an E. Arbeiter is a German word for workman or laborer. And so uh, it was a place where uh, the workers, the German workers, would get together uh, after they got home from work or perhaps on the weekend and, and socialize. Matter of fact, in the 1920s, uh, the name was changed to the Workmen's Aid Society. And then by the 1930s, it was called the German Beer Garden. As we look down from the satellite view, uh, we can see uh, in this uh, rectangle, the red rectangle, this is a property that uh, Arbeiter Hall uh, owned. 
And so there was quite a bit of property there. And I imagine they socialized and used that outdoor property as well, perhaps for games and so forth. But on the 1911 Sanborn map, that whole area where the red rectangle is, was labeled a beer garden. And I, I put that clip from the map right here so you can see what it looked like. And there's also a, a long storage shed as well, which possibly included outdoor recreational equipment uh, that they used to play games and so forth. They had quite a bit of property. There are arbiter halls all over the country, and the one in Port Huron was quite uh, modest compared to some of them. This is the arbiter hall that was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. As we zoom in here, you can see the words Arbiter Hall off the top of the building. And this is the one that was in Detroit. I was never in Arbiter Hall, but most of them around the country had a certain uh, format to them. The main floor was a very large open room, which was the hall itself. And uh, most of the time this was used for social gatherings or, or for dancing. They had quite a few dances there as well. And then uh, in the basement was, uh, was known as a Ratzkeller. Uh, this was a bar, a basement bar, that's what the word means anyway. And then on the uh, second floor, they would have smaller rooms, which would be meeting rooms. It must have been difficult for the immigrants to come over here to America and learn the new customs and uh, our language. But there was a place that they could go and relax and enjoy themselves and speak in German to each other and be at ease. And that was Arbeiter Hall. Join us in our next video and we'll get back to Lapeer Avenue and go west and see what there is to see.